Welcome to our final session of the seminar. Uh, those who were uh, uh, yesterday in this final session knows how it it works or how it uh, what are requirements for it for it to function. Uh, so I think today we have a little bit different situation because we didn't have time uh, for questions uh, immediately after the, the Werner's uh, uh, lecture. So I want to open the the, the session with those prepared questions that would, weren't, be able, weren't able to be addressed in, uh, in the morning, so please, uh, I know there are some prepared for the small talk after it, from the, so please start, this is my suggestion to start with, with, uh, with the question concerning uh, Werner's lecture because we missed that, uh, that part and discussion of this very inspirational and intriguing lecture, so please uh, Start with your. It doesn't have to be a question. It can be comment or critique or uh, whatever form you you find most suitable for your ideas. So, Sasha is the Maybe usual yeah. suspect. Again, because, uh, it, 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 yes, it concerns uh, Bernd's uh, lecture and it's something uh, Mr. talked about uh, briefly after your lecture. And uh, I was uh, it concerns uh, this, this uh, specific methodological status of uh, new liberal uh, or ordo liberal uh, theory. Uh, I mean, it, it was uh, in order to get the elaboration rather clear that it is not uh, like an empirical theory. It, it, it's basically uh, uh, it has a normative uh, status. I mean, it's not uh, descriptive, but uh, prescriptive, you know, uh, it's not uh, like a description of really existing uh, neoliberalism, but more or less a recipe of how neoliberalism uh, should work. So uh, here the simple question uh, is uh, simply what can this uh, normative theory tells us about, say, actually uh, existing uh, socialism or how uh, should we think about the uh, neoliberalism sorry <laughs> uh, so uh, how should we think about the, the nature of this relation between this normative theory and uh, the actually existing uh, neoliberalism no yeah oh, okay um, well, I, I, guess, I guess three answers two, two have to do with neoliberalism and one hasn't. Uh, the two answers are these. Neoliberalism, first of all, is, has a vocabulary which is liberal, which is proclaims for freedom, choice. So here we are. <coughs> are you going to criticize choice and freedom? Neoliberalism is an idea of a free labor economy. Are you criticizing that? Do you want a coerced labor economy? Or? It is very strong, takes the oxygen away of the critique, neoliberalism. So it's not just normative, it actually takes the oxygen away in public, public debate. It's very difficult to argue against the proclamation of freedom of choice. But that's their proclamation, that's their vocabulary. The, the second answer is, is this. When I talked about the European subsidiarity principle, that's my, my phone, don't worry, uh, the subsidiarity principle, <coughs> that, is, that is a reality. What happens in Greece and other places, in Spain, is a reality. And it's the reality of, 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 of liberal free market enforcement. So it's not just a normative commitment. Actually, I have four answers. The third answer is this. Neoliberalism never, will never reach its aim. There will never be unimpeded markets where the invisible hand can operate. That, however, also means it is never satisfied. It is always renewed. It is a very aggressive theory in that sense. It's like the profit principle. No? If you make money out of money, that means you never make enough money. If that's where it's money making more money, there's never enough. Constant renewal, never satisfied, always have to posit more, beget more money. Neoliberalism, in a sense, is the political articulation of that. Never free enough, always to be aggressive, always intervening. And on neoliberal principles, of course, the economy can never be in crisis because it never was what it should be. So it's a very aggressive 
aggressive concept in that sense. The fourth answer is this. I think neoliberalism will not be wrong to look at it as a, as a worldview, which you can then move on to another worldview and another worldview. There's more to it than just the worldview. It's not just an ideology in this, conven in this conventional sense. It's more than a, in an ideology in this conventional sense because it's the theology of what makes capitalism tick. Free labor markets, free economy of labor. That's the doubly free labor upon which profit maximization, maximization depends. And neoliberalism doesn't analyze what the free labor is. It doesn't provide you with a social theory that tells you how this system is constituted and so on. But it expresses the need for what needs to be done to make it free in almost theological terms. Yeah? So it's not an ideology. It's a theology of, of capitalist economy. And that makes it quite dangerous because theology involves moral judgments. <clears throat> and if a moral judgment is right, then somebody else's moral judgment is wrong. Between good and evil, good has to succeed. They see themselves on the side of what is good. Makes it, again, aggressive, but also theological in, ex in its expression and articulation of capitalist necessity, namely the doubly free laborer who always returns in competition with other laborers to make a living and who then dares to complain. Okay, that's that. The last answer is, is not now relating to neoliberalism, but to Max Weber. Bob just had the example of the Weberian definition of the state, the hmm? monopoly holder of the legitimate use of violence within a confined or clear territory. Now let's think about that. For <coughs> it's a good definition to think about. I mean, Smith's idea of the state as police is the same Marx's idea of the state as a concentration of the coercive power of society is the same. But think about Weber. When did Weber say that? 1919, he said that. It's a very strange definition in 1919, if you think about the historical context. Hmm? What was the context in 1919 in Germany? Did the state have the monopoly power of the political? It didn't, because society had social movements Armies had weapons, I'm sorry, parties had, had weapons. They yeah, were shooting each other, assassination. Society was politicized. The state did not have the monopoly of the political in 1919. You can think about territory as well. Yeah, of course, the German Reich then had lost lots of, 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 of territory. And the definition now was, how can we, as it were, <coughs> define our nationhood? So if you think about Max Weber's definition, not just as a formal definition, was an analytical decision, but a pronouncement, as it were, in a particular historical context, yeah, it entails the demand that society be depoliticized, disarmed, yeah, that society does not assert itself as a political entity, but that the state reasserts successfully the monopoly of legitimate violence, of the political. That means, in fact, to depoliticize society, to take the political out of society, and to concentrate the political character of society successfully in the form of the state. It entailed, therefore, the political state, what's left of society, if you take the political out. That's a private contract society, a depoliticized society. So far, OK? Is my example? So, oh, and that, that really, we, we use this, this, this definition now, of, this, of, of Weber's definition, as the analytical basis of our argument. But in fact, if you look into it, it's a clear statement of what ought not to be the case, what ought to be eradicated, disorderliness, a politicized society, and that an exchange society can only function on the basis of the rule of law, not political manifestation and assertion of society, not a politicized society, but a society that really does comply with the liberal rule of law and therefore conducts itself peacefully in a civil manner as an exchange society where the contact between the individuals is governed by contract, not by the fist, not by the weapon, not by politicization. Yeah? And if you now say, oh, Weber's definition is just a normative commitment, then you actually take away the political importance of that definition. And that's the definition which is entirely actual. 
of what yeah, Jesse would call power relations or relations of social force, or what I would call the concentration of the political in the form of the state. Yeah? It's a struggle, it's a constant struggle. And the independence of the state is not something given, but it's something that is daily, on a daily basis, reproduced. So it's more than just a normative commitment. It's more than just a world view. It's more than just an idea. It's in fact a source, a precondition, a precondition or a premise <coughs> of, of, of a liberal society. Yes? Uh, well, I'm opening a new team, so... I wanted to quote this. Okay. okay. Um, so, because Sasha more or less drew me in already by mentioning that he had earlier the uh, discussion. Okay, I agree. Um, um, but I want maybe, okay, since I'm part of the organizer, maybe an, an attempt of an ecumenical comment, which may be perceived as heretical, uh, especially for uh, Werner, but maybe also for, for John and Jens. So I would think, um, in comparing, in comparing some of the analysis that we have heard, I would um, uh, argue, and Werner can okay, uh, also say that he's not satisfied with, with my, um, with the way I describe uh, the, the general uh, direction of his of his um, of his analysis. But I would, um, okay, if we say normative. Normative is an aspect, but you add, and this is of course an important point, that uh, it is not abstractly normative, but that it has immediate, um, that it is um, a, a, a programmatic, uh, that it, that which produces, um, which has its uh, effects, which produces a certain type, you even mentioned uh, morality and, uh, and so forth. And it is, in, in that sense, um, um, a structuring force, uh, or, or these are the ideas behind a certain uh, processes in their, but I would argue in their the way you present them by, with with by, by by going through the theories of the ideologists, uh, the uh, order liberals and neoliberals. This is a maximalist program, which is an uh, in the, I believe the the um, which also uh, and at the same time which uh, is useful uh, to have this analysis because it shows very clearly the full scale implications of of a concept of society where where, uh, um, where the, the free free market or the uh, market forces uh, has to be uh, is absolutely privileged and at the cost of explicitly at the cost of of uh, uh, democratic aspirations or whatnot so this inherently inscribed authoritarian or anti democratic tendency to have this so clearly drawn out from the very foundations of the of the thinkers in their a normative or maximalist or programmatics, whatever you want to call them, is of course an important, I be, uh, believe, uh, uh, an important um, um, reference point to, uh, for for then for for, for what uh, for for the concrete for the concrete understanding of processes which are happening now, because it it, it prevents us from merely uh, fr from a um, combination of mere description and and uh, eclectical. Uh, 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 you know, approximations. So, if this is, I believe it is very important to have this uh, uh, drawn out clearly. But then I would argue that another question is: Okay, this is the full-scale program, the programmatics. This is what it, what it implies in its full-scale realization, and this is uh, this is uh, this, these are the effects which is already producing. This is also an important. Uh, okay, at that point we already are on the ground empirical grounds, but I believe that then. The level is then the question, of course, but this happens, of course, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a context of uh, contestation. There are opposing social forces. There are, and this is, I believe, where then this type of analysis, uh, as we have uh, uh, John and Jens have provided, um, is not is in, not in contradiction to this type of uh, the, the analysis uh, you have provided uh, your emphasis, but rather I believe that they are complementary in this sense. Um, uh, they are uh, simply uh, maybe it's a question of of, uh, um, of a different level of, of, of concreteness in terms of institutional and policy uh, uh, policy um, perspectives. Well, thank you very much. But I'm not quite sure that the what I want to do with the, with your question. Because on the one hand, it's an invitation to be a sectarian uh, who, uh, who disagrees with the others on the basis of a scholastic principle of what scholarship or what the right idea is. So you're contesting on the basis of, 
what is the more, as it were, appropriate, the more radical approach. I, I don't think that's a good thing because that gives us back to theology and, with how, and the question of how many angels can sit on the, on the top of a pin. It's not, 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 not helpful in a way. It's, it's the opposite. <laughs> what I think is much more important is what do the dif distinct approaches, as it were, bring to the analysis, the uh, empirical analysis? What are they able to enlighten us about? How do they reveal? And there might be that one or the other of the approaches that you heard about yesterday and today can do more than the other. It's more radical as the other. Not radical in a political sense, but radical, in fact, in understanding the root of the matter and therefore bringing out enlightenment. So I think whether or not an approach is complementary, better, or whatever you come across there, it has to be measured, or has to be discussed, not on the basis of one theory against the other. It has to be looked at in terms of what, how it engages, or what it reveals about the society in, in which we live. If we don't do that question, then we're we are talking about whether there are five million or just one million angels sitting on a pin. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that is a very scholastic argument, almost theological in terms of who has the right and who has the wrong idea, who has the right commitment and who has the wrong commitment. Every theory is perverted by the society upon which it reports. In other words, there is no perfect theory. Um, and to claim that there is, is claims to be the invisible himself or herself. That doesn't, that doesn't happen. What has to be happening, however, is to see what it does in relationship to reality, what it brings to the fore what it therefore is able to establish in a radical, non-compromising sense, revealing <laughs> reality, criticizing reality, not for the sake of criticism, but for the sake of deciphering as to what really are the social forces or the social relations, the <coughs> constitutive, the constituted, whatever vocabulary you want to use, relationships that manifest themselves. And secondly, what is the force of necessity in this society? What other words, what belongs to its concept? What is the concept of the state? What belongs to it? What is it capable of? And where does can't it go? Where, in other words, does our theory become utopian in its conception of the state? Very important to, to understand that. The two theories, I suppose, talk about that in terms of my terms, necessity, others in terms of contingency. Yeah. And one has to see what these different approaches bring to the topic in terms of what lies within it. What is, in our examples today, what is the EU capable of? What, is, what, is, what lies within it as a necessity? Is the necessity contingency, contingency, and now I become critical, contingency, opportunity, and democratic transformation? Or is the necessity the constant attempt at liberalizing labor markets that would be my approach? Now, then we are no longer talking about the theories now. We are now talking about the reality before us. And we have contesting, non-complementary approaches to that. And it might be that one or the other, I'm not saying which one, uh, is the better one to, in fact, understand what's going on here, what lies within the concept of the EU, within the concept of the state, within the concept of a free labor market or the free labor economy. Yeah? But then we're no longer looking at the angels, as it were. Then we are, in fact, looking at reality and we endorse or dismiss a theory, not because of the angels that, that we don't like, but because it actually does not deliver the concept of reality. Yeah, does that make sense as an, as an answer? Can I have a short reply? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, okay, uh, to be fair, I think that um, opposing necessity and contingency in this way, uh, I believe that um, uh, the other approach we heard uh, that is not, uh, does not, uh, does not um, deny that there is a certain underlying necessity. The question is at which level uh, uh, does, it, does it work through all the scales, all the levels of obstruction, or are there, uh, at, uh, um, within this framework of necessity, are there, within a given historical situation, constellation of forces, is there a, vari a variation of possible outcomes, which are, of course, structured by, by a field of necessity, but I don't think that uh, necessity uh, can be understood as, as leading to one uh, single, uh, to one, um, 
I think that the best thing, I may be wrong with this, but the best thing about thinking structural necessities, if you talk about capitalist societies, is, is the field of possibilities which it, uh, which it allows, rather than of necessary outcomes. Otherwise, uh, otherwise um, you eliminate uh, history out of the picture and contestation. And you talk about elucidation and the concept, and I agree fully on this. And I agree it is uh, very important to emphasize every time anew, um, also for the left, especially on the left, that there are really necessities inscribed in this very mode of production and uh, um, uh, in terms of uh, the value form itself and if we go even to the state form and so on and so on. All of this has to be elucidated and, and emphasized again and at the risk of, of, of going very far in, in terms of intellectual pessimism. But um, the question uh, is then, okay, um, if the left is more than just merely a commentator, an elucidator of the concept of reality, but the left, by definition, uh, also um, uh, has the pretension of intervening and changing, uh, uh, changing this reality, uh, then what may seem banal or trivial or irrelevant from a structuralist point of view, or, or you, not structuralist is probably the wrong word, but from a, a mere analysis of necessities, well, this is where then um, uh, where, where the analysis of the concrete constellation of, of, of a space of maneuver, which is of course always confined to, to what, 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 um, what the uh, structures which, uh, of necessity uh, produce, this is our only chance of, of intervention. If intervention is, is, is a goal we have not completely abandoned. So that would be my final point. Mm. The crisis of the 1920s, 30s brought about a number of responses. <clears throat> One was Nazism and the other was the New Deal. It was the American workers' struggle for the New Deal <coughs> that f finally won the way in terms of the Western European settlement after the war. So that's the American workers struggling for the New Deal and not being killed like their German comrades in 1933. There's no problem with that analysis. That is a reality. We are living in a time of great economic crisis and clearly you can choose to live in China and be exploited in China under a one-party dictatorship or you can choose, if, you have, if one has the choice, as it were, of travel to live in the United States, to live under the rule of law and reproduce yourself on flexible labor markets, <coughs> cleaning up after the McDonald's customers have left. You can choose that as well. Now you have to make a choice, as it were, between that Chinese command labor economy, greatly dependent upon a state, enforcing labor discipline, often more often than not by terrorist means, or you can live in the United States of America, where the discipline of the labor market has been internalized as a consequence of terror. That is it. In neither case, however, Will you not be a seller of your labor power who is responsible to make her own, their own living, her, her, his own living, <coughs> and be employed by means of a wage, which is in fact the outcome of a previous uh, full process of exploitation? That's the necessity of the system. But of course, there are different contingencies the contingency of a command economy, the contingency of a society based on the rule of law, clearly that is the case. And whatever path these countries will take will depend on the manner in which the class struggles unfold. However the class struggle unfolds, however, what remains is the worker as the seller of his or her labor power, dispossessed, employed by a fair wage which has been produced or which represents a value of a previous process of exploitation. That's a necessity of the system, from which none in China, here or there, can escape. So within capitalism there are lots of contingencies and lots of possibilities of the manner in which labor power is treated. <coughs> uh, the difference in treatment does not come automatically. It is an outcome of a decade of hundreds of years of internalization of discipline and struggle. The uh, fact that we are in the West are talking about an eight-hour week, uh, eight-hour day, is not because the day is only eight hours long. It is there because it was fought for. 
that doesn't change the relationship, but it establishes a civilized, or what looks like, a civilized existence of the relationship, a determinate end to the working day, which of course now is being taken away, because now you can, t you can work all the time, and now in fact there is no longer an unemployed worker in Western Europe, but only employable workers, and the employable, employable worker is neither employed nor unemployed, but always employable. So that's my answer to necessity and contingency. Um, can I have just a short yeah, yeah, of topic course. of neoliberalism before yeah, this? Yeah, of course. If everyone has a question or comment that is uh, <coughs> closely connected to, to the debate that is going on in, in, in strict terms, now just pop in because the dragon is waiting for it to open different time from different angles or different topics. So please. So this is this is more like a some general question about neoliberalism. It's not strictly connected to, to Werner's lecture, so it's basically for everyone or anyone. But um, it's it's about the basic not definition, but basic way we perceive or understand neoliberalism at all. For example, Philip Mirowski has uh, the definition of neoliberalism as a thought collective or epistemic uh, community, uh, which I think is, is, is too short because first it, it emphasizes neoliberalism in the realm of ideas, shared concepts, uh, research projects, uh, ideas, um, and so on. But it leaves out its its uh, whole political dimension first, and its institutional reality. And the second, uh, I think it's crucial. And then we can we could, of course, uh, employ this Althusserian notion of institutional material uh, reality of ideologies. So ideology is not about or not just about ideas, but their material existence in the uh, ideological apparatuses. But this, this second approach leaves out precisely the, the ide, ideational realm or um, uh, ideal uh, content of, of neoliberalism. And, and I think, I mean, this, this is my question. I haven't got very far in this uh, thinking. Um, um, I think one of the crucial points or question that have, hasn't been, at least to my knowledge, explored enough in regard to uh, actually existing everyday or grassroots and neoliberalism is precisely the relation between these two levels. The level of conscious political or ideological commitment and the level of unconscious, uh, uh, let's say, unconscious everyday practice, especially when it comes to civil servants or uh, people who work in uh, public public institutions, as, especially in, for example, in uh, uh, education, social services, and so on, where you have, uh, in, uh, where you have increasingly this, at the first glance, paradoxical cases. For example, even people uh, who are committed uh, leftists, uh, on on conscious level, whose voting behavior, political commitment, political choices, and sometimes even activism is lefting, but their actual practice when they work in um, in these institutions, which are not just ideological apparatuses, but also social institutions, institutions in charge of social reproduction, uh, in their everyday practice, they employ. Uh, uh, neoliberal ways of acting, of everyday practice, this, uh, the, the, the most banal, prosaic, everyday uh, uh, practice. So, for example, you have outspoken uh, left-wing uh, civil servants who anyway have no problem with implementing uh, more entrepreneur, uh, do, doing a program that implements more entrepreneurial spirit in uh, elementary schools. This is, this is a real local example that uh, I had I had contacted, or even um, uh, left-wing parties, not just in their. Uh, uh, let's say macro political action, but in their micro organizational issues begin to adopt um, neoliberal methods, for example, like uh, strategic uh, strategic uh, planning, uh, they, they employ timelines, they, they strive for better uh, efficiency. So I'm interested about the uh, real and also uh, practical and epistemological status of this 
type of unconscious everyday activity, which this is my hunch or intuition, um, tends to increasingly, and I, I think this is at least my intuition, I think this, this is crucial for the success of neoliberalism, that this, uh, let's say, unconscious, spontaneous way of doing things uh, inside, uh, especially state institutions, public institutions, tends to override uh, conscious political commitment. So it's becoming increasingly irrelevant uh, what do you privately think about the world, whether you hate capitalism, vote for the left, as long as you, in your actual uh, practice, further this program. And th th this neoliberal program has been uh, amazingly successful precisely because of this, let's say, unconscious programming. I know it's a very awkward expression, but I'm ending with the question mark. Yeah, okay. I understand this Lenin. Lenin's idea of the withering away of the state. And Lenin says in the State of Revolution that the state is able to wither away once the people have the state in the head, once discipline is internalized. So that's the, that, I guess, is the Foucaultian term of governmentality. No? Your mentality is governed by the discipline. And governmentality is learned. It's not something that you're born with. Not some spontaneous eruption. Governmentality is learned in schools. It has been learned historically. A history of governmentality. Not something that happens yesterday. A worker who sells his labor power and has to work, say, out, out of an eight-hour day for four hours to reproduce the wage that has been given to him or her in exchange for the labor power, doesn't go away and leave at four hours. He stays for eight. That is part of the governmentality. And enforced. The, the circumstance that you, at the edu, at the edu, that the educational system should do other than this governmentality is, is really idealism. The education is there so that people know, learn, how to behave in the society in which they exist. It's an institution of governmentality. It cannot be different. It cannot be different. Um, the governmentality in our society is also something like a freedom that is coined. Coined freedom. Everything we do is not because we are communists or because we are idealists. Everything we do is because our bond with society. Can you hear it? These are my coins. No? My bond to society is in my pocket. That decides how I live. In comfort. In peace. With a roof over my head. Here, it's here. It's not my communist being which determines that. It's the money in my pocket. Now think about the seller of labor power who is defined or is conceived of by the critical <laughs> literature as somebody who has no independent means of subsistence. That's the definition. He or she cannot live without selling labor power. That's all they've got. And they're not selling labor power because they're entrepreneurs. They're not selling labor power because they think, oh, what a boring day it would be without the sale. They're selling their labor power because of this. That's their link with society. That's my access, the workers' access to subsistence, constant strike, sorry, strife against all other workers who experience, who experience the same conditions. Flashes of great solidarity, because this experience is also a unifying as well as a disunifying writing force. And it's always about this. So what governs my existence is not my communist being, but in fact my governmentality, which exists in my pocket. Here is my link with society. That is what I have to achieve. The more is in here, the greater is the comfort of my, of my life. Yeah? This is my access to subsistence. It's coins. So the freedom that I am experiencing is a freedom that is very much coined. It's a coined freedom. And it's in here as well. It's my governmentality. Do you want to sell your labor, pa labor power cheap? Oh, good. 
Do you do voluntary work? You're working for nothing. I forget about the food on the table. No. It drives your governmentality no? every day. The working class does not struggle for socialism. It struggles for subsistence, for food, for access to subsistence. And the governmentality in which that is addressed is in their pockets. Sometimes they're quite empty. Yeah? Now, if you go to the Leninist tradition, that is what is called trade union consciousness. And that is then rejected as false consciousness. That would be the other consciousness, which doesn't exist because the only consciousness you can have is, in fact, in your pocket. You don't live by ideas. No? You live by bread on the table. Here it is. That's the governmentality. What neoliberalism does is to articulate that. However wrongly, <laughs> however deceptively, and it's a, it's, it's a deceptive theory, but actually it articulates that. It does not say that your life is not a life of coin freedom. It says it is. It recognizes the despair of the labor market. And it says, be an entrepreneur. Hmm? Be an elbow person. Push the other one out of the way. In that, of course, it is very much anti-trade union, which seems to suggest a different mentality of collective responsibility, yeah, of collective action. But that collective action was not an anti-capitalist action. It is an action of moderating the elbow society on the labor market and to achieving this in your pocket, your link with society. You hear them jingle? They're increasing. Huh? Because now I'm a trade unionized worker and as such I have a better chance of payment of a wage which is higher than the worker who is leased out. Yeah? So your complaint, as it were, about neoliberalism is a right one, but it's not one that is normative or the ideality of, of some thought. It actually is a critique of an existing society where the bond with society exists in the pocket of essentially dispossessed people. If you're dispossessed, you have got nothing in your pocket, but you have to have it in order to live. And that are your hands that you sell for a certain amount of time. So it's not an ideality. If you go back into the history of political thought, whichever one it is, Locke, God knows, they are not theoreticians of ideality. They are theoreticians of how best to organize this reality. What belongs to the state? What is the idea of money? What belongs? It's, it's basically thinking how to organize this society in the most effective manner <coughs> so that its contracts, its reproduction, you know, is assured. It's also a history of political thought which is quite clear what the demos, democracy, unlimited, might mean. It's the rabble of the paupers. But you can't get rid of the paupers either because it's part of the conception of wealth. The dispossessed laborer is, the, is entailed in the conceptuality of profit. You can't get rid of the paupers. So the question is, how do we organize them? How do we capture them? How do we integrate them into our system? How do we cut off their dangerousness and make them um, or give them a the mentality? which is in fact conducive to the social reproduction of the system which doesn't imperil it, which doesn't endanger it. Yeah? So if you think about the dispossessed labor, there's nothing here, it's still making noise, no? but actually there's nothing in here. If you think about that person and the despair to have something in here and then look at political theory, it reveals itself as something quite other from what it appears. It's not free thinking, ideality. No, it's thinking about real problems of social constitution and social reproduction <coughs> and how to, how to keep the rabble of the poor out and how to make them work on the promise of a liberal reward for labor that will accrue to the nieces and nephews. And that is precisely the critique of Benjamin who says that in the thesis of history, that this is the promise also of social democracy, which cuts the hatred, the anger felt by the poor, hmm? takes it away. 
and therefore it's always an investment by the few, by the poor, into the future to ensure that the nieces, or thinking, believing, that the nieces and nephews, the future generations of workers, will not be workers. That is the connection with the, with the liberal reward of labor in social democracy that is criticized by Benjamin in his thesis of history as the, as the, as the idea of heaven will come. Yeah? That is also, in other words, Benjamin therefore is not an ideal, idealist, but in fact he recognizes the, f the, the, the force of this promise. Yeah? Who wants to struggle? Struggle belongs to a shitty world. In a good world you don't struggle. Struggle is the expression of a world that really is bad. But who wants to struggle in a bad world? Because struggling means it is gone, no? You risk endangering this. That's the difficulty of struggle. It's easy to, get to, to think about how to get rid of the bad world. But if you think about this, it becomes more difficult. No? You have to risk your connection to society. As a class, individuals can do that. Individuals can be risky characters. But a class, a whole humanity, should it really struggle and lose this? You hear it? It's fantastic, no? It's a 50 cents coin. <laughs> <laughs> So, what are we now, or uh, yeah, sure, yeah, just a <coughs> short comment. Uh, obviously, uh, we could have an endless debate on neoliberalism. Uh, I just want to make uh, maybe two points. Uh, I, I cannot actually remember who it was that um, maybe Robert Cox or somebody like somebody like that <coughs> who said that we should distinguish between. Uh, neoliberalism as a project and neoliberalism as a, as a process, and that kind of, I think it's a, it's a nice distinction because it, it allows us to think about neoliberalism as a thought collective. That's like, yeah, you know, the intellectual history of neoliberalism that started back in the 1930s, and then we can also think about you know, the, the implementation of these uh, of these policies. Uh, that were actually more present, uh, let's see, in, in Germany after the Second World War, uh, or, or in the UK and the United States in the 1970s. And so we can get get rid of this confusion that usually um, pops up when we uh, when when we are not actually sure do we mean you know this thought collective, this intellectual group, or do we want to? Kind of designate uh, a, a a sequence in in economic and political history. But that would be uh, the, the first point. And the second, with regards to the uh, to the notion of governmentality, uh, Foucault and uh, just mentioned him a couple of times in his lecture. Uh, Foucault made his analysis of, of, of neoliberal governmentality is actually pretty good on this on this couple of issues. Uh, first. Um, um, he really tried to emphasize what Primoz mentioned: how neoliberalism works at at the uh, at, at the level of everyday life, as it were. And uh, but he does it like really theoretically, and he um, basically uh, points to the question: um, what what is missing in the classical or the neoclassical approach to labor? And. Uh, his answer is that what is actually missing is that neoclassical tradition, including Keynes, who starts with uh, he started as a student of Alfred Marshall, he treats labor as a um, as a factor of production, and neoliberals start to think, okay, what is labor besides uh, besides a factor of production, and they they try to give a completely different answer uh, than the one that Marx gave, and they and here. We, we can see the basic contours of the um, theory of human capital, which, uh, which is a way of uh, not only uh, linking reality uh, of governmentality to the content of my pocket, but also really um, using the metaphor uh, of capital in a more profound way. 
So that it, it's not just that uh, <coughs> laborers are now linked to governmentality in terms of the money that they own. It is also this <coughs> new idea that they themselves constitute some form of capital and that they need constantly to invest and reinvest um, their, uh, their, uh, uh, their abilities, uh, or maybe to say they, ne they need to go to this pro constant process of reinvestment as if they are a firm. And that is a powerful weapon in terms of creating political subjectivities, I think which is not maybe so much visible in, um, in let's say, debates on macroeconomic as aspects of neoliberalism, but it's actually quite effective on, on, on really bringing different subjectivities into this neoliberal order. And we can see kind of a confirmation of this uh, simply from the fact that uh, now it is common that usual, uh, uh, some kind of normal capitalist firm will have a special division uh, that is uh, that is actually concentrated as specifically on accumulating human capital and so on. And um, the other point, so this is uh, so I think this is if, if we are like searching for the power of neo neoliberalism and um, uh, um, uh, reasons why it is so su so successful quote unquote, unquote in interpolating different subjects into its order, I, this, this, this could be a, a good entry point, I think. And the other thing, which is kind of uh, more, po which can be seen as more polemical from the Marxist uh, position is um, the point where Foucault kind of emphasizes the distinction between liberalism or neoliberalism and socialism. And he says, um, Liberalism doesn't actually have a, a theory of state. It, it, is it, it is constantly focused on developing new forms <laughs> of technologies of power. And so it doesn't have an ur text, as it were. There, are, there is no pope in liberalism in any form. And so this allows this, this particular discourse to be more flexible and to kind of incorporate new, uh, new obstacles as they emerge. And so uh, his point is that uh, Marxian or socialist uh, discourse and liberal discourse, they are, they are actually functioning on, on, different, on different levels. And they have, uh, and they have uh, different goals in a way. So it is kind of difficult. Um, it is difficult to kind of compare them. And, it, and, and the very notion of success in each of these discourse, uh, discourses is different. So uh, may maybe we are, and this, I think this might be uh, kind of uh, dangerous if we start to think about the notion of success in, in, these, in these terms of, uh, of, uh, of creating a, a, new, a new governmentality or, um, uh, or a new technology of power because uh, Foucault, uh, um, Foucault um, um, obviously points to the question whether a socialist governmentality is possible, whether a socialism as a project is capable of doing something more than intervening laterally. And of course this is an important <coughs> question and it is in a way a, a kind of a, fa a final goal, but I think it's kind of important at the same time to distinguish these two notions of success in each economic and political success in, in, in each of these in each of these cases, because it, I, I don't think that you know, socialism in any form or shape can actually, uh, uh, can actually compete with neoliberal, neoliberal discourse in its own terms. That, that, would, be, uh, that would be kind of uh, the, the second point that I, was trying to, uh, that I was trying to draw attention to. So if there are any responses to Minister intervention, or there are not even continuing Dragon's question. Um, well, first, uh, re regarding the new liberal thought collective. Um, well, I mean, when when, this, when Mirowski describes it, he sometimes employs the metaphor of a Russian doll, and I think this implies a certain um, consciousness of uh, the material existence of the whole thing ranging from professors and faculties <coughs> through peer reviews to journalists and so on. So I, 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 don't, I don't think, I mean, if anybody, I think Mirowski 
uh, is not really favorizing ideas in themselves outside of their material existence. Other than that, I think it was a very good comment and it helps in not thinking about the Mont Pelerin society as a conspiratorial <coughs> Leninist or underground organization or something like that. Um, well, otherwise, um, what I wanted to uh, ask is perhaps uh, addressing the dawn of the neoliberal era from a more historic uh, uh, perspective. Uh, Werner, um, <clears throat> uh, Werner described uh, in a very compelling narrative uh, how in, in uh, periods of systemic crisis the demos barges into uh, uh, politics and democracy and uh, he mentioned uh, four conjectures. Now the fourth one I will put aside here, the peanuts and the uh, pockets because it's still an open story and we will see. And I'm more interested in the comparison between the uh, three other ones. Um, in, in, in the 20s and uh, after the Second World War, there were very positive outcomes uh, like gender equality, uh, extension of voting rights, um, also, I don't know, Hobbesbaum's golden era of the short 20th century. Uh, whereas I think the third era of politicization in the late 60s and the early 70s, it, it perhaps somewhat stands out in this regard. Um, this, this was the age of, I don't know, uh, the West German police state or Italy between the communists and the Christian Democrats, uh, the Gaul's Fifth Republic, Thatcherism, uh, the dictatorships in Greece, Spain, Portugal. Uh, so my question is, how, 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 to, how to address this? First of all, do you agree with this uh, 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 standing out of the third area of politicization? And in, how, how to address it? In what way was it different? Either the politicization itself or, or, or uh, the era against which it was politicizing? There's a very interesting German neoliberal who's so interesting that I forgot his name now. But he has a very nice quote in his book. And he says, the greatest danger to democracy is the democratization of society. And I think we need to keep that, that little sentence in mind. The greatest danger to democracy is the democratization of society. What does the democratization of society mean? <coughs> it means self-organization of social events, of the economy, of the neighborhood. It means not recognizing the political state, but in fact politicizing yourself, threatening the boundary, as it were, the independence between society and the political state. Yeah. So the, the greatest danger of, democ of, of for democracy, he says, is not the democratic state. It's the democratization of society. Permanent demonstrations, occupation, or what Weber dismissed as the dictatorship of the street. That is, he says, the biggest danger to democracy. So if that is the biggest danger to democracy, then of course you have an answer for 68, because that was not necessarily an event that, at its start at least, looked at the state in conventional terms, but looked at itself democratizing life circumstances, sexual, rock, drugs, not drugs, that's not really good for political activity. <laughs> but it was taking charge of itself, of, of the manner in which it thought society should reproduce itself. And that was the biggest danger to democracy in Germany and in other countries. In the 1970s that was no longer the case. But that is the threat to democracy, self-democratization. It's almost like society demands that the state returns to society, no longer independent from society. It is a demand that society governs itself rather than being governed. 
breaking down all sorts of social connections where people are kept different, are distinct from each other. <coughs> That's the biggest threat to democracy, says this Henning, is his name, <laughs> says Henning, this neoliberal author. Okay? So if you want to think about the Gaulle and the Algerian crisis and political mobilization in France, if you want to think about 1968, if you want to know about the slogan of the former German Repu Democratic Republic and others where the people said, we are the people, why should a state start to be uncertain that it was the expression of society demanding democracy, self-determination? Hmm? Does it make sense? So if you want to look at the question, you have to ask yourself. Ask yourself, why do figures, major thinkers, in political philosophy, political theory, but also neoliberal thinkers, say basically that? Namely, democracy, social democracy, not the party, society democratizing, is the biggest threat to our system. Yeah? Going into the system, is not a great danger, because the system absorbs it. The, see, the system marries this to liberal state purposes. It has learned to marry it to liberal state purposes. But society standing up and wanting to be counted, self-determining itself, that's the biggest threat to democracy. Very briefly, just uh, to your question and to the question of uh, neoliberalism as a project and as a process, I mean, the situation that you've been describing that this, uh, uh, this teacher uh, is obviously practicing. I'm addressing you. <laughs> as a, this, this teacher is uh, practicing ne uh, neoliberalism in an everyday life. I mean, I would, I'm totally in line with you, Werner, but we could, we could do it with Foucault, and I think therefore we can see that Foucault and Gramsci are close by, it's a question of hegemony, but we could also go back to Marx, the 24th chapter, Primitive Accumulation, there Marx showed us that people have to be brought to follow the, 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 the necessity of capitalism, they do not do it automatically, they get cut off their ears, they get branding marks and all these things when they run away from being exploited. So and what we could learn also from E.P. Thompson is that they have to learn to adapt to time. As you said, that they do not go out of the factory after four, four hours because if they would do following their, uh, their feelings, they probably would do, but they learn some sort of discipline. So I think here comes Marx, Foucault and Gramsci, they are coming together and in that way capitalism uh, doesn't, is not, is not being something that has been um, simply obstructed on us, but it's, it's, it's because we in, um, how to say, uh, because we, there's something in us we that incorporate. we incorporate, that's it, that's the word, thank you. We incorporate it and the same is with neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is a specific form of capitalism, here I'm also totally in line with you. It's capitalism still, but it's a different formation of capitalism and therefore we don't have to forget, we've been discussing this yesterday evening with, for, for example, Boltanski and Chapello, uh, these two authors who say that, it is a spe that neoliberalism picked up a specific form of critique against the forwardist state type of control thing with which many, many artists, liberal, progressive liberals in the 60s and 70s, 68 movement were dissatisfied with. They said, we do not want to be governed like this. We do not want the state to control every way, what, what, every way that we are living. We want to be entrepreneurs. We want to have our freedom. We want to have free choices. We, want, we don't want to go for, for, into the factory for 40 years. We want to do this and that and that. And there are elements of a critique against Fordism, which in a way showed itself to be uh, unsustainable at, uh, in the 70s, where neoliberalism in a way is an amalgam, uh, a mixture of different mo modes of critique, even a, a, a sort of emancipatory critique, and therefore that people like your friend uh, who's working in the school and bringing up entrepreneurial uh, practice to the children is probably not the worst thing, since um, Simply being controlled is not, is, is, is not the alternative in a way. I, I'm exaggerating the, the polls. So, therefore, coming back to Marx, coming back to Gramsci, or, uh, Foucault, or whatever, uh, as, as Bob was saying, co a rule is all, if it has to work for a time, is something that has to be uh, incorporated. Uh, it's, uh, coercion plus consensus. 
and that goes to everyday practice. So therefore, I, I don't find it astonishing at all that somebody labeling himself or herself being a left-wing person is in everyday practice following something which uh, might make sense. So it's not, uh, it's not, yeah. Can I come back on that with another illustration? Taylorism, assembly line. No. Is that something we really want? <laughs> to be told what to do when exactly. with that hand movement. Like do this, do this for eight hours. Your hand folds off, no? Well, this is Taylorism. Huge critique against it. Because no? you want to determine, you want to use your brain, you want to use the ingenuity <coughs> in the production process. Because here, Taylorism, no? do this. Don't do this, you lose time, do this no? for eight hours. It's a fantastically machine-like operation. You're not a machine, you want to be human. Neoliberalism doesn't actually take this person away, but it designs him differently or designates him or her differently. On the question of human capital, the same thing comes in. What is human capital? It means, if one thinks about it, to invest in your skills, no? to be a skillful person. Are you really against that? Yeah. It's a person who can do different things. I mean, not like Marx, working in the morning and fishing in the afternoon. But you are actually able to do different things. You have different capabilities. And that really is fantastic. So good. The idea of human capital is you work for that factory today and then you bugger off and work for that factory. You are not tied to that employer. Is it a good thing? It's a good thing. Yeah, it's great. Who would not subscribe to that? The ability to do many different things. To move about. To be not tied down to just this job, do this, not for eight hours, for 48, that's a week now, now you can sleep, and then it's another 50 years. And here is human capital. It actually is a very b bad term, because it's a term which condemns the unemployed and condemns the employed. It's a very bad politics, but actually it picks up on something which we all aspire to, the ability to be skillful, to be able to do something with your left hand as well as your right hand, to do something with your head, to do all sorts of different things. Fantastic. And it picks up on that. And it tells the unemployed, be an investor in your own labor power. That turns it round. That makes it what we condemn. But in fact, it picks up rightfully on something which is equally condemnable. Do this. Hold your arm up. You get a cramp quite quickly. <laughs> And it's every movement is clocked, huh? timed. Do that for 50 hours. Overtime, huh? not paid of course. With something around, you, around here because you can't really go to the toilet. It's a disruption of the assembly line process. What a fantastic life now to be a car worker. Huh? Moving around in overalls, looking at the robots. So just think how it picks up on something dreadful, but then turns it against itself. Does anyone have another question, comment to relate to these topics or something completely new? We have still a half an hour, so please. I promise to shut up, but maybe it's not uh, past one hour. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are now on parole. Okay. Just um, going back to, to the question of necessity and contingency. <laughs> you won't leave it just. No, but, it's, but I think it's important. I think it's important. And not because, well, not because I made the point, I think it's generally important. So. Um, Everything you said about the pocket and this, okay, this is capitalism. This is this is what one has to understand every time anew. That it's when we talk about the capitalist mode of production, it's not an economy, it's not abstract figures, it's not all the statistics we hear and we read in the business news. It's this existential uh, existential situation, which is uh, of the of the worker to understand what it means to be a, a wage wage laborer. This is fundamental, and this needs to be elucidated, absolutely. But what you then say, this is, this, uh, um, this is precisely the aspect of necessity which makes people like us, most of us, uh, say this has to change because it's fundamentally unacceptable. And this then is not a question of the contingency, of course, within the existing framework. If that, if that is the, uh, what structures our reality, our everyday life, 
if this is what capitalism produces, or, or, or what, what it forces us to become in terms of whether it be terrorization or, 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 or uh, entrepreneurs of the self or what not. I mean, these are all effects of this fundamental, uh, of this fundamental uh, structural imperative uh, to sell one's labor power, as you have said, and make it, make it uh, more um, appealing to the potential buyer. This is what makes us the left. This is uh, in, in, not in the social democratic sense, but this um, uh, makes us. Uh, this is precisely the indictment, the fundam our, uh, an, uh, an important aspect of the fundamental indictment. Uh, in, in, how do you say? Indictment. 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 In the indictment uh, of of uh, of, uh, of Marx and and many other uh, many others since. So I don't think that, uh, of course, within capitalism, the question is you can choose between if you're lucky or not geographically or. Uh, uh, and so on to, to uh, find a more or less appealing form of wage uh, or, or of the existence of a wage laborer. But uh, what I believe, it is not irrelevant which form it is. Not because it is more or more pleasant to be exploited in in a, in a Western European democracy. Of course, it is than being a child laborer. Uh, um, I don't know in, in a Bangladesh textile factory or uh, what not. You want to be that bad already? It's just for children. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> precisely, okay. So, um, but I believe, and this is uh, where I uh, believe that this type of anal uh, an analysis which, which goes into, into what may seem from this, from this height of, 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 of analysis, uh, analyzing the structural necessities, um, uh, which may seem pity, but it's basically uh, a question of a relative degree of the immediacy of, of this imperative and uh, the, the temporal, uh, the, uh, not only the temporal uh, dimension of it, but also what it allows you, well, the free time you need to organize or, or, or what not. I mean, uh, so there are strategic implications in the level to which this imperative is mediated through different forms of capitalism and institutional arrangements and all that and all that. This is important not because only I think that it is better to be uh, an, uh, exploited in, in the way of the, you know, not uh, in Western Europe, but also because this is uh, 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 an important requirement of uh, a strategic uh, uh, requirement of, uh, of, of opening up strategic possibilities of overcoming the, the, uh, the, the wage form itself, that is uh, the perspective of, of ending this this fundamentally unacceptable form of society. So, and this is what I'm missing uh, when you're saying contingency is simply reduced to, uh, you know, if you have the luxury of choice between being this kind of exploited laborer or that kind, if we agree that the fundamentally this uh, exploitation is the problem and everything that is developed from it, the capitalist mode of production, be it neoliberal or Fordist or whatnot, is the problem, well, then. Then all of these other things, then the strategic dimension comes in, and then all of, of all of all of the institutional and, and whatnot uh, variations have a, a strategic uh, have a strategic um, relevance, and differentiation becomes important, I believe. Because uh, my last word, because Michael Heinrich, had, uh, even Michael Heinrich, someone who argues fundamentally from a very principled uh, point of view from this from the question of you know what are the uh, uh, fundamental necessities uh, of the system what is this system uh, underneath all the variations he is uh, at one in one text or, or another he said uh, arguing against this this um, Roma, uh, this naive view of uh, immiserate, um, immiserate theory on the left where the world left he said the worse for the workers the better because then there will be revolution he said well Histor the historical rec record proves precisely the opposite. In the 60s and 70s, you know, when you had uh, massive labor unrests, this was, from, from today's perspective, you know, uh, and historically seen, one of the best times, uh, historically times, for the workers as such. So it's not only, okay, one would argue, yeah, they were co-opted, you know, that's, the fr uh, that's, you know, Marcuse or whatnot, but, you know, were they really so fundamentally co-opted, you had strikes, you had... Um, uh, you had a crisis in the 70s, and a crisis of the uh, British state to the extent that, that members of parliament, of the British parliament, as we hear, were arguing freely, uh, uh, were openly, or the ministers even, were arguing uh, openly in, in, the, in the press that, that maybe one would completely have to cancel uh, um, liberal democratic niceties because uh, this, uh, the situation has become chaotic and ungovernable. 
so um, okay, so that would be my point. If it has been clear. Neither the capitalist nor the banker nor the worker can extract themselves from a reality to which they belong. That's that's the first point. When I when you talk about strategies, it's it's good to have them. But it's very important not to look on the bright side all the time, but to look at the eye of the problem and understand it. The left historically has never looked into the eye of society. It always looked on the bright side. And by looking on the bright side, it presupposes that the intellectual doesn't in fact belong to the society in which he or she lives, exalted position. It always believed that the worker only belongs to capitalist society in itself, but not really for itself. The bright side was the for itself. But no capitalist, no banker, no worker, no individual can extract themselves from the society in which they in which they live. It is true that in capitalist society, wealth is produced for the sake of more money, not for the satisfaction of needs. That's the sideshow. And yet nobody can extract themselves from it. Capital is nothing really. Have you ever said hello to capital? Kissed it? Embraced it? Shook his hand? Can you paint it? Some forms of human capital, I've met. No, no. <laughs> capital as such is entirely invisible. It's not the machine. Capital is really is just a name for a particularly constituted form of social reproduction to which everybody belongs. You cannot touch it, you cannot kiss it. And yet it commands you to adapt. And nobody can extract him or herself. <clears throat> now, if we now talk about strategies of extraction, as it were, then that is, of course, in reaction to something that we deem to be wrong. But is your answer, your strategy to what that what is wrong, not also part of what you resist? Are you not in your strategies affected? Or does, the, does that what is wrong not in fact comprise your know? It is easy to say what you are against. It's no problem. It's very easy. It's very impossible almost to say what the no then means in terms of a yes. This is what we have to do. Because that yes derives in fact from the false society that you condemn and what derives from society belongs to society. Now, I'm not asking you not to think about ways out. I already mentioned the democratization of society, the politicization of society, mass movements and, and mobilizations. But what I want you to do is to be more, how, how would you call it, to argue with more humility in relationship to the one whom you claim to represent. <coughs> You might extract yourself as individuals, or you think you have extracted yourself. A class can't. That's why it is a class. If you think you should extract yourself, then you condemn those whom you wish to represent, because they don't do it. As a class, this is what they have to think about, the food on the table. So I don't want you to stop thinking about how to create the alternative. but. I also don't want you to look on the bright side and thereby forget what the issues are, what the perverted character of this society entails, how those who produce the wells are eaten up by them, by the wealth creation process, and have to allow themselves to be eaten up by it, because that's the only means to have access to subsistence. So by all means, think about alternatives, mobilizations, 
the democratization of society. But not once kid yourself that by doing so, you are already outside the system. No. The alternative that you pursue derives from the system, is part of the system, gives dynamic to the system. In Marx, the argument is that the class struggle is the history of it. But this history is a history of class domination. This class struggle that is to end history, that's certain history, is the end of class. So what does it mean in this context to speak about the working class? That should struggle, for what reason? To reproduce the system, the history of class struggle, or to end its existence as a class? What does it mean in terms of strategy, consciousness, organization, a history of class struggle which has not ended, which will not end tomorrow either? Think about strategies, by all means. Think about politicization, cooperation, the horizontal society, very important, because that is the alternative for capillary of a society which doesn't exist. That is the organizational vocabulary of negation, and this is the negation that Marx called communism. But don't kid yourself that by thinking in terms of negation, that you're no longer part of a society from which the negation derives. I'm reminded every day. Never, never think. Never think on the bright side. The bright side will kill you in the end. You really want this not to be. There was a perfect nice last phrase. No, no, I have to. I, I, this might not be the most pertinent thing, and I'm opening not one but two can of words, but I, um, my soul will not, not be. A, Address, I say. Uh, regarding this uh, Fordism, post Fordism, I wasn't present at, at this session, um, but I have a quite a uh, problem with this ideal type uh, succession presentation. First there was Fordism and everything was rigid, and then there was post Fordism and everything is flexible and everything that comes with it. So, uh, but I will make it short, so just. Uh, I will name just two examples, so just to peer into a can of worms, not to open it uh, completely. Um, but uh, my first example would be if you believe Boltanski and Chapello, which I don't, I have a huge problem with their thesis, uh, that uh, somehow the, the critique of uh, a rigid, if you believe that some, some kind of ideal type of rigid for this society actually existed and then it's libertarian critique by some kind of cunning of history or reason or whatever uh, translated itself into a, a new form of uh, domination in another ideal type this time flexible uh, uh, post-Fordism we already start from what is a revisionist view of 60s in uh, Europe, especially 68. Uh, uh, we take as our starting point the, a tiny uh, petit bourgeois minority political position in a, in a movement that was that was very workerist. That was uh, um, even in Italy it called itself workerist, uh, operaist movement. So it was all about factories. There were huge discussions about party armed struggle. Um, in, in France, they were Maoists, so not only were they not some uh, petit bourgeois guys who would liberate their discourse and uh, so on, they, they were even, um, at least from the limited material that uh, I'm acquainted with, uh, it was actually, they, they were embarrassingly uh, vulgar Marxist in, in most uh, uh, or very schematic Marxist-Leninist in, in most cases. But undoubtedly, this was just some kind of, we want to be more creative, more in, entrepreneurial. Why were there millions and millions of people uh, in Italy, in France, in other countries uh, on general strike if it was just about uh, unleashing creativity, which then, by some rules of history, found itself uh, in uh, neoliberal post for this mode of domination or technologies or power. Uh, this, this would be my first example and the second. 
Um, if, if we could read neoliberal turn in public or social uh, institutions as having, let's say, some at least implicit or potential uh, uh, liberatory kernel, uh, how would you then explain the fact that the most emancipatory project in a limited case, limited example of uh, psychiatric institutions took place, uh, for example, in, in France uh, immediately after the Second World War and went on until the 70s. Um, and then its uh, mental health policy took a, a drastically repressive back turn or regression. So, for example, from the late 40s through 50s and 60s, Foucault was a latecomer there. You had all of these progressive uh, um, experiments in uh, psychiatric hospitals. You had removal of bars on the window. You have community treatment, abolishing of hierarchical division between a doctor and patient and, and so on and so on. Um, and now you, now you basically have just pharmacological treatment like you turn people into vegetables and leave them in the rooms to rot. Um, and this, this precisely, this very emancipatory uh, uh, process was going on when there was supposed to be a rigid state control, a repressive uh, state institutions, not in post-Fordism. Simple answer to that is... Uh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. No, I, I just I think it's important to mention, uh, if we talk about neoliberalism, that, that was what you said, that it w to understand the victory of neoliberalism and the dominance, that it was not a, a, a frontal at attack. You know, it was a kind of a mixture of attack, uh, cooperating um, gender uh, questions, uh, liberal critiques, um, picking up. Uh, things from the 68 movement, etc. Uh, I think we have to keep this in mind to understand how it, the victory was so fast. I mean, it's incredible uh, how fast um, neoliberalism could implement its, um, its dominance. And I would even think it's important to, because you, you criticized, if I got it right, um, diff to, to uh, make a to think about different forms of capitalism, like Fordism and, and post-Fordism, or... No, just ideal typic presentation. Yeah, yeah, okay, but, but if you want to make, to, to identify uh, different phases of capitalism, you have, I mean, I think it, it's something, uh, something which, which has a, a relation to, um, to the real world. So it's not just in Weberian, Weberian's sense, um, ideal, idealist type, but um, it is the intention to understand a, a specific constellation and to understand how maybe you have to resist this specific um, constellation, how you, how you have to um, formulate critique in this speci uh, specific constellation, because um, if, if we think about a different type of capitalism in Fordism or even uh, in space, uh, I mean different type of uh, Capitalism in United States to to, to Sweden or, or something like that, you have even you have to fight in different terms or in different different ways. And I, so I think it's important to to understand um, to to make different phases. I mean, I, I think the regulation theory has um, a quite interesting starting point, uh, the French regulation theory, which said um, as Marxists we know that capitalism is coming periodically to crisis. And thousands of Marxists were uh, um, saying, OK, this will end up in five years, and there's no more uh, surplus value anymore, and capitalism is over. But that, that's, this was not the, the case. And there are different answers. The answer of country was one answer. But um, I think in, in the 80s, uh, the regulation theory said, okay, what we have to explain is not the crisis. We know that the crisis will come. We have to, what we have to, uh, to explain is, um, or to understand is that capitalism is much more flexible than we thought. Yeah, a, a, form, a capital, capitalist formation is, is collapsing, but it's coming a new one, and a new one which we couldn't imagine that it could, could exist. 
So, I mean, um, if you, if you uh, look in the, in the capital, when Marx was describing the, the fight for the uh, 10 hours day, so there, there were a huge kind of, of, of people saying, oh, this is the end of capitalism. Because specifically, these two hours are the two hours we are, we are getting our surplus value. So if, you, if, they just, if we now start to work just, they uh, work just 10 hours, we are finished. So uh, the same uh, is coming later. I mean, the forest capitalism with welfare state was, it was impossible to think that, some, that uh, the state could give social assistance to people which didn't work. It was something you couldn't believe that this can uh, happen. And it, it happened, and it happened in, in a capitalist productive, productive way because they are, we are creating new markets, etc., etc. So I think, um, um, yeah, it's important to, to understand this flexibility of capitalism because so you know, you know, yeah, there will come the crisis. Maybe this, maybe even this neoliberal constellation will collapse soon, but we don't know what, what, what is coming then. It maybe it's a form of capitalism we could not imagine today. Or maybe a new society would, would be nicer. <laughs> I think in the name of us all for the organizers, it was very well done and thank you for all this nice food and all this very well. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>